Good evening, everybody. Come on in. Welcome to tax time. I don't know about you, but tax time is always a fun time for me. <laughs> Since I obviously don't have a life. Um, I'm Veronica Dangerfield, and I'm the senior financial educator here at Patelco, and I want to welcome you all in. I hope you uh, get comfortable. We had a beautiful day today. The sun was shining and my allergies were blooming right along with the flowers. <laughs> so thank you so much for taking the time to spend uh, your evening with us. We're going to give it a few more minutes and then we're gonna go into a, a rousing, fabulous presentation on taxes. But I was wondering, did you know that today is National Good Samaritan Day? Uh, it recognizes the unselfish actions of those who provide help when needed. The day is also known as Good Samaritan Involvement Day and celebrates kindness in all of its forms. So with that, I wanted to start with a quote. Kindness can transform someone's dark moments with a blaze of light. You'll never know how much your caring matters. Make a difference for another today. That's from Amy Lee McCree. Yeah, right on, Myrna, right on. So I wanted to go ahead, since we have quite a few of you here, and, and talk a little bit about our house rules. So um, thank you so much for um, starting the chat. So we're going to use all our chats for comments and communications. We're going to utilize our Q&A just for your questions. Uh, and also, since it is Good Samaritan Day, please understand we cannot answer every single one of your questions, but by golly, we're going to do our best, okay? So please be patient with us. Um, if the chat distracts you, please minimize them. And remember, it is so important to be nice. So you, I, um, I am Veronica Dangerfield, but we also have Andrew Farrell here. He is going to be uh, on the Q&A. And we have the lovely Peggy, who is going to be on chat. So we're all going to be together supporting you in this amazing presentation. And I just also wanted to remind you all that our next um, topic is estate planning, trust, and wills. That's going to be on March the 27th at 5.30, and we will be um, um, leading an online estate planning platform in the U.S., and we're going to talk about why estate planning is so important. We're going to talk about what it takes to create a legally binding estate plan, and we're also going to be talking about the difference between a will and a trust. Okay, and now I would like to introduce to you my friend, Timothy Roscoe Carter. Not only is he a qualified tax expert at the Low Income Tax Players Clinic at Justice and Diversity Center for the Bar Association of San Francisco, he has his Master's of Science in Taxation. I'm telling you, everybody should have a friend like Timothy. Uh, yes, this, there, will be, there will be a recording and it will be available and we will email it to you um, within the next uh, week. So don't worry about taking notes. We will be sending you a recording. Also, uh, he has two decades preparing taxes and practice administrative law. He is a Bay Area resident for 30 years. He has three children. He is an avid dungeon and dragon player. And watch out now, he has a black belt in Taekwondo. So if any of you guys act up, <laughs> proceed with caution. So uh, Timothy, can you go ahead and um, um, uh, go through the, um, the, uh, my, my two slides? Okay, yes. Yes, so. Uh, so remember our Patelco promise, we are um, teaching you how to manage effectively so that you can be resilient, so that you can seize opportunity and rise up to your best financial life, okay? And again, we have our rules. Um, we just finished the rules. 
So use the chat, Q&A, um, and remember to be nice. And now, without further ado, please welcome the amazing Timothy Roscoe Carter. Yay! <laughs> Thank you very much, Veronica, for that enthusiastic introduction. I, I definitely appreciate it. Um, so uh, today, this will be the, the tax update for uh, the 2023 and 2024 tax years. Uh, yeah, she, she lets you know who I am there. And um, in I so I'm run, I run the low income taxpayer clinic. And in terms of what we do there, it's a it's a it's a national program which is funded in part uh, by the National Taxpayer Advocates Office, which is a sort of semi-autonomous uh, branch of the IRS. We provide free representation to low-income taxpayers before the Internal Revenue Service and audits, appeals, collection, and before federal um, courts. So, um, if if you meet our income criteria and you have some sort of problem with the IRS. Give us a call. We might be able to represent you. Um, uh, we receive matching funds from the IRS via a grant program, but we are independent of and not associated with the federal government. So we are um, a completely third party. We're here to, to represent you. Um, and each clinic, we independently determine whether or not we think a, a, a case has merit. Um, the three things that we do, one is we educate taxpayers about their rights and responsibilities, and that's what I'm doing here today. I talked about the free representation. We also um, uh, uh, ad advocate for issues that in in impact low-income taxpayers, and we also provide um, free consultations to anybody on individual tax matters, and so we don't have income limits or anything like that. So if you're just looking for advice on your tax issues, you can definitely give us a call and we can um, and, and I can help you with that. I can I can give you a free consultation, even if we don't end up representing you. I wanted to start today by giving a uh, um, uh, by, by going over some general information about our progressive tax system. A progressive tax system is a tax rate that increases as taxable income increases and as you as you can see here, that's the idea. As the pie gets bigger, if you've got a bigger pie, the uh, progressive taxation may take a bigger portion of it. Um, and so, individuals who earn higher incomes are taxed at a higher rate. There's a couple of different ways to do this. One is to exempt the first portion of an individual's income from taxation, uh, and another is to have a graduated tax rate system in which different income tax brackets are taxed at different rates. We do both. We have our marginal rate system, and then the um, and then we exclude a certain amount. That's our standard deduction. Everybody can take. That's that, that's a, that's um, a portion of your income that is not taxed. Um, so here I just give an example. You get so um, from zero to eleven thousand of taxable income, you're taxed at ten percent. Um, uh, this is for a single filer from 11,000 to just over 44,000, you're taxed at 12%. Um, and then over that to just over 95, you're taxed at 22% and so on. Going up to the highest rate currently is 37% for incomes of over um, 578,000 for an individual. Uh, so I, I want people to know, sometimes people think that if I don't know if I'm gonna if I'm making more money I might uh, I'll go into a higher tax bracket and then I'll lose money because I'm getting taxed at a higher rate. That is not the case. That is not true. Uh, what happens is that only is that only the the extra portion above the um, the 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 old rate the 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 part that takes you into the new rate that's the only part that is that is taxed at the higher rate. So, uh, for example, a person in the who makes uh, who makes one hundred twenty thousand be in the twenty four percent tax bracket, um, but as as you can see here, the the second um, one with the graduated rates shows you the first bit of it that's part of the standard income; it's not taxed at all. The second little bit of it is taxed at ten percent, and so on. 
And the result is that even though this person has a 24, is in the 24% tax bracket, their actual tax rate is about 16%. That is only about 16% of their total income has been taxed. Hey, Timothy, can you push a full screen um, so that um, um, oh, our, yeah. our, our, our attendees can see the full screen? Yeah. Uh, oh, they didn't have that. That was, um, okay. Hold it's, on. okay. it's okay, um, you can. Okay, yeah, it's that, that's not working here. Sorry. Um, uh, oh, wait, just skip one. All right, so if, if you were to look at our, our, um, our country's income tax burden, um, you you'll see that um, like here the 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 one to the furthest left is the bottom fifty percent of the country makes um, uh, about uh, eleven percent a uh, little more than eleven percent of the income and they only pay about three percent of the income tax uh, and then you go up and then the as you go up they pay higher percentage so the top one percent. Uh, of the country makes about 20% of the total income and they pay close to 40% of the income tax. So this this is graduated very going very high. Um, it, you sometimes hear people saying that we should have the, that some people think we should have a flat tax rate, meaning that everybody pays the same percentage regardless of their income. Well, this this progressive taxation is only the federal income tax. When you add in all other taxes, our sales taxes, our um, uh, employment taxes, property taxes, all of all of those, uh, it turns out that we do close have very close to a um, a uh, a flat tax system where people where the people in each tax um, uh, in in each income bracket pay about the same rate of of their income in taxes. Pay about the same uh, percentage of the of the total income tax burden, uh, and I uh, just want to give an example of who's better off without an income tax. So California has one of the higher um, uh, income tax uh, uh, state income tax rates in the country. Texas uh, has no um, income tax, uh, um, no state income tax. Uh, yet uh, the bottom uh, twenty percent in California um, pay about ten percent of their uh, of their income in state taxes, which is sales taxes and other kind of use taxes. Primarily sales taxes, though, um, and maybe user fees for things that the state government does. Um, in Texas, those all of that adds up with the sales taxes and everything else. They end up paying. 13% um, of their income in state uh, um, taxes, even when you, so uh, even though, so even with the, the income tax uh, here in, in California, uh, the poor people pay less for state taxes than in Texas. And even the middle 60% uh, uh, in California pay a little bit less in state taxes. Now, if you're in the uh, top one percent, you are you would be much better off in Texas. So, uh, starting with some of the uh, the the recent tax law changes um, going into effect now for uh, 2023. Um, so business meal meals are now only 50 percent deductible, which is back to pre. Uh, pandemic norms. Uh, so if you have if you um, uh, have a business meal, you can only take half of what the price of the cost of it um, as a deduction. During the pandemic, it was up to 100 percent, but now it's back to 50. Uh, and then uh, they had something starting in uh, 2018 of allowing um, people to, uh, running their own businesses to take bonus depreciation. Uh, 100% of a certain amount of the um, 
of, of expenses could be depreciated. That is being reduced 20% per year starting this year. So this year, you can only take 80% of the bonus depreciation as a deduction. Uh, 529 plans can be converted into Roths if they weren't. So 529 plans are, um, uh, are, are, are tax deferred savings plans that uh, are for the people set up for the education, usually their children or the grandchildren. Um, and uh, sometimes they don't end up getting used entirely for education. They, um, the, the person may, um, for various reasons, just may not spend as much as, is, as in the plan. Now it can be converted slowly, kind of, you, you still have to meet the, the, um, the, the uh, regular income contribution limits, but um, you can convert the money that isn't used for education into a Roth for the um, for the same beneficiary. So the child who would have used it for um, uh, for their education can now convert it to be used for their retirement. And uh, and they uh, begun something called a starter four hundred one k plan uh, that that's beginning this year, uh, um, twenty twenty four. It's for um, employers who, for whatever reason, either don't or they're not large enough to really set up their own regular large 401k plans. Um, uh, the, these plans, uh, do they're, they're considered starters. There's lower um, contribution limits. The contribution limits are the 6,000 as opposed to, I think it's about 22,000 uh, for a regular 401k. They, um, the employer um, contributions are not allowed. Um, uh, uh, but uh, on the other hand, it's a much easier system to set up. A lot less, um, a lot less paperwork, and so it's easier for uh, some employers to offer them. And this year, as within most years, there are a lot of tax items that are inflation adjusted. I, I didn't want to go through and just hit you with a bunch of tables of 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 increased um, uh, tax attributes, but I'll go through some of them. And if it, and if they apply to you, you might want to look up and see what the new um, rates are. So the standard deduction, just about, well, most people are going to be using that. Uh, that's gone up. The marginal tax rates, um, they've been inflation um, adjusted. So as I was saying, the tax brackets at a certain amount, at a certain level of income, you're that you go into a higher tax bracket, well, that level of income is inflation adjusted. So you have to make more to go into the um, higher tax bracket. Uh, there's a, an exemption for the alternative minimum tax that's gone up. Uh, the maximum amount that you can um, get for as an earned income credit, that's that's gone up. The standard mileage rates for like a business use of your car or medical use of your car, um, those, have, those have gone up. Uh, contribution limits for retirement accounts, those have gone up, and the uh, maximum credit for adoptions, that's gone up, and that's just that's just some of them. Something that's not happening right now, but um, but people should get ready for, is the um, expiration of most of the uh, Tax Cut and Jobs Act, which was enacted in uh, 2018 and made a good many changes to the uh, to our, our tax system and um, just about all of it is scheduled to expire on uh, in, at, at the end of 2025 unless Congress um, reenacts it and that depends on the outcome of the um, election and then also what the what they decide they want to do um, so it, it should be prepared for this. Um, so one of the things that'll happen is the, that's scheduled to happen is that uh, miscellaneous, uh, the deductions for miscellaneous expenses, um, such as employee, um, uh, uh, unreimbursed employee expenses, uh, your, your tax preparation, your personal tax preparation as an, ex as an ex deduction expense, uh, a lot of those go into uh, miscellaneous expenses, those were eliminated. There, it, they'll come back after 2025. Um, the child tax credit was increased. That's scheduled to um, to go back to I think a thousand. Um, 
and there's a return of a partial phase out of itemized deductions for taxpayers with incomes of over uh, 267,000. This is um, uh, it, it, right now, um, itemized deductions can be taken no matter what your income level with no um, with no reduction or no phase out. There's a partial phase out that was in existence before 2018 that's scheduled to come back. Um, let's see, can I move this oh yeah, so um, so here here's a couple more that are um, important. So this the the standard deduction is is going to be reduced. Uh, but the personal exemption, which was eliminated, will, will come back. Uh, the, the qualified business income deduction, uh, which is a special 20% deduction on business income, um, uh, that's that's set to expire. Uh, there will be an increase in the marginal tax rates uh, because those went down with the in, um, in 2018, so they'll go back up. And there's a return of deductions for personal casualty and theft losses. So. Like um, if you have um, like your tree falls on your house and you have a and you and um, and you have a loss because of that or uh, or some you have um, your car stolen or something, uh, those deductions have been eliminated, but they'll um, schedule to come back in 2025. Okay, next I want to talk about the uh, 1099k. I'm not sure exactly how many people are going to end up. Being affected, but um, it's gotten a lot of press. Um, I, I know, and it's something that a lot of people are, are worried about. Um, the the and I, here's an example of what 1099 k looks like. Um, it's an information reporting form. So third party electronic payers such as PayPal, Venmo, um, uh, and the credit card companies. Um, they you you pay them and then they pay some and then they'll pay the merchant. Um, uh, well, those uh, th those companies will now have will have to start reporting more. Now they do have to do some reporting um, uh, with on the ten ninety nine k. And when they do report, they issue copies of the report of that form to both the IRS and to the payee, the person who received the money. And this is only for business transactions. So the old rule was that a 1099-K was required if the payee received at least $100,000 from the electronic transfer company during the year, and the payee receives at least 200 payments from the electronic transfer company. Uh, so it was basically large businesses that were receiving um, a lot of income that were um, uh, uh, that were sub that 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 were getting the 1099, the K. Um, the new rule is that it will be required if the payee receives at least six hundred dollars from the electronic transfer company during the year. The number of payments is irrelevant; it could be in just in one payment. Uh, this new rule was originally scheduled to begin in 2022, because it's confused and scared people. It's been continually sort of pushed back. It's currently scheduled to begin um, tax for tax year 2025. Um, for 2024, this is in something to know going forward, particularly if you have a business or something where you're you're getting some um, uh, payments like through Venmo or, or PayPal. Um, the uh, This is a transition year. So the for 2024, the 1099K will be required if the payee receives at least $5,000 from the company during the year. And, um, and here, again, the, the number of payments will be irrelevant. Um, some more things to know about this. One is that this doesn't change your, your tax reporting requirements or your tax liability. If the income used to be taxable, uh, then even if they weren't reporting it, you were required to put it on your return. Um, and so the, this this is just the IRS is finding out about more of it. But you if you you were you already had to pay tax report and pay taxes on it. Um, 
uh, you might be need to be aware that some companies might be issuing the 1099-Ks this year under the new rules uh, because a lot of them were gearing up and programming all of their their um, uh, their accounting software to send it out the 1099-Ks under the new rules. And the, it was just very recently, just, just before the tax um, uh, season started where they, they, they changed it and said that it wasn't going into full effect in for, for this year. The, um, and there's, and, uh, um, and one of the things that scared people. And so you'll need to particularly be, a, um, be on the lookout for if you receive a, a 1099K, um, either one, if you weren't expecting it because you don't have a business, but even if you do have a small business and you receive it, you might want to um, check it and make sure that the amounts are right um, because uh, particularly if it's like from Venmo, people use Venmo for paying for business transactions, but they also use it for a lot of personal transactions, uh, uh, sending money to their their friends and relatives, helping to, to split a, a dinner bill, that sort of thing. Um, and those uh, could mistakenly get, it, get uh, reported on the 1099K, even though they're not business transactions. And so uh, you wouldn't be required to pay taxes on it, but you would need to be ready to explain it to the IRS um, later if the IRS came and asked why you didn't include all of this on your um, uh, on your uh, tax return. So there's a lot of new uh, energy credits that are um, that are have been starting up. Uh, so there's the um, uh, credit for the installation of um, energy saving improvements to your home. Um, and uh, that was actually increased to 30% of cost and a maximum of $600. And uh, that had been scheduled, that was a lower amount and it had been scheduled to um, end, but now it's been extended through 2032. I'm gonna be seeing that year a good bit here. Um, there's a solar energy uh, tax credit uh, that has been that has also been increased to 30 percent and extended through 30, 2032. And starting for um, tax year 2023, the solar energy credit could uh, can also be taken for qualifying battery storage. Before it was just for the actual um, like solar panels, the collection units. Now it, uh, it can also be used for battery storage. Uh, and there's a tax credit for qualified motor vehicles, um, uh, and that's been extended through 2032. And the criteria um, uh, for new vehicles has expanded, and it now applies to some used vehicles. It used to be only new vehicles. Now some used vehicles um, you can get the energy credit for. Uh, and and then there's a new credit uh, for uh, that you can claim for installing an EV charging station in your home. Um, and again, that's scheduled to run through uh, 2032. So there were a lot of changes made during the during the uh, to to the taxes uh, during the pandemic. Most of those have reverted back to normal, but the, there are a few that are. Um, um, that are still kind of left over and we're dealing with. Um, so uh, your student loan payments made by an employer on behalf of employees uh, and, uh, up to $5,250 per year are tax-free to the employees if they're made um, before the end of 2025. So uh, you know, if, you're, if you are an employer and you wanna give a benefit or maybe you can convince your employer um, uh, you can pay each year the 5,000, uh, you pay this year 5,250 and it'll be tax-free. And then next year, uh, 5,250 on the student loan and that'll be tax-free. Um, if you didn't get one of the stimulus payments you were entitled to receive in 2020, um, you have until April, I say possibly July because it's unsure about whether an extension of time to file applies to this. But um, you have until April 15th, basically, of, of this year to claim the stimulus payment. So there were three stimulus payments that went out, two for 2020, and then a third one was is listed as being for 2021. Uh, if you didn't get one of the first two 
uh, then you, you can file a return or amended return to claim it, but you have to do it before April 15th of this year or you lose the ability to, um, to get it. Uh, they they pass an expanded earned income tax credit. Uh, most most of that uh, has dropped off, but there's a couple of permanent changes. So um, it used to be you could not get any earned income credit if you were uh, filing as Mary filing separately. Uh, now it is available to some people who do that. Um, investment income limit uh, that for the earned income tax credit was increased to ten thousand dollars, and that's permanent. And then single filer um, uh, EITC is available to taxpayers uh, with children who don't have social security numbers. Before you had to list your social security numbers of your children. Now your children don't necessarily have to have those social security numbers. Uh, and there was expanded uh, ACA, um, that's the Obamacare assistance. And uh, these were extended by the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, so through 2025, there used to be a 400% federal poverty line cap that, that has been removed. That is the premiums, you, you couldn't get a subsidy for the premiums under Obamacare if you made more than 400% four, uh, 4 of the um, federal poverty line. That's been removed, and instead, what they have is a premium for the benchmark health plans, um, which is capped at eight point five percent of your income. So even if you're um, making over four hundred percent of the poverty line, um, you if your um, premium uh, under Obamacare is more than eight point five percent of your income, then you can still get a subsidy for that amount over the eight point five percent. And uh, they increased the um, percentage of people who are eligible for zero premiums. That is a subsidy that would cover the entire premium uh, that's been increased to people make up to 150% of the federal poverty line. Some other permanent provisions, um, other changes made during the pandemic that, were, that are permanent. Uh, so um, uh, the special teachers unre unreimbursed expenses deduction uh, it, it continuing can include protective equipment like um, for protecting against viruses and that sort of thing. Um, and then uh, the medical expenses for itemized deductions above 7.5% are deductible um, on a permanent basis that had previously been scheduled to increase to 10%, which means you would have had to pay 10% of your income before you could start getting a deduction. Um, but that that didn't increase, and so it's just the you only have to pay a seven point five percent before you can start taking the deduction. Uh, there were changes for forgiven home mortgage interest debt. So normally, if you uh, if somebody forgives a debt, like a credit card company, you don't you you have credit card debt, you can't pay it. Eventually, they just write it off. Um, that write off counts as cancellation of debt income. Uh, because you had received income and you didn't pay taxes on that receipt of income because you incurred a debt. But if the debt goes away, you still you still had the income, so the income is um, uh, is taxable. Um, there's if you get into that situation, call me. There's it's complicated, but there are exceptions, and a lot of people meet the exceptions. Um, but that is an issue with forgiven debt. Um, however, canceled principal residence acquisition debt that is debt. Your, your mortgage to buy your home. It's excluded from income. Um, uh, it had been uh, through 2020, the, uh, um, ex um, the exception was up to $2 million um, for, uh, for everyone except Mary filing separately. And, but from 2021 through 2025, um, it's only up to 750,000 of, um, of home mortgage debt that is um, excludable if it's canceled. Student loan, uh, normally that debt cancellation is treated as regular taxation, uh, taxable cancellation of debt income. Um, however, uh, all student loan debt cancellation that occurs this year or next year will be will continue to be tax-free. So if it, as long as it's before 
um, the beginning of 2026 that your student loan debt is canceled, that you will not be charged uh, cancellation of debt income. Uh, the home working um, expense de deductibility. So um, this was a, a deduction for unreimbursed employee expenses. And as I mentioned, that, that had been eliminated uh, by the, um, by the uh, Tax Cut and Jobs Act. And that was, and that continues at least through 2025 that it's eliminated. Um, but after that expires, it may come back. Uh, if you're actually self-employed, you can still claim your home office deductions as normal. Uh, uh, you do need to know that you're, you, you have to use um, an area of your home exclusively and regularly as your principal place of business. This can be rather complicated, um, and so you need to discuss it with your tax preparer or call me. Uh, so uh, casualty losses, I had mentioned that those, uh, that the personal casualty losses, I talked about that earlier, be, be eliminated through 2025 by the um, Tax Cut and Jobs Act. However, for the pandemic, um, they, uh, um, they, they did allow, allow you to um, take them if it's attributable to a federally declared disaster um, uh, and, until 2025 when it's scheduled to come back for all casualties and losses. Um, COVID was still a federally declared disaster through May the 11th of 2023. So you could still have some COVID related um, uh, personal casualty losses if it's attributable to that. It applies only to property destruction, not lost wages. And um, you can't take the deduction for losses that are compensated by insurance or by relief payments. Um, it might also apply here in California to a lot of the floods that were happening um, last year. Sure. Okay. So, um, uh, I, 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 so I want people to know um, that the the volunteer income tax assistance um, is a program that offers free tax help to people who generally make about $60,000 or less or persons with disabilities, limited English speaking taxpayers and need assistance in preparing their own tax returns. Um, there are VITA sites, there are dozens of VITA sites uh, run by um, uh, a bunch of different um, organizations all throughout the Bay Area. Uh, the, the best way to find them is to go onto the IRS website and just search on the website for VITA, the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance, and they can, um, and they'll pull up a thing where you can look regionally and it'll give you lists of all of them and the contact information. Uh, there's also, um, you can also look up on the IRS website, Tax Counseling for the Elderly, which is um, a similar thing, free tax counseling and preparation for people 60 and older. And um, something that you probably won't, I mean, you can you, you can go into the IRS website and see if you qualify. It's very few people are qualifying this year, but it's something to keep in mind and be on the lookout um, is uh, IRS direct file. So like the, you know, you know TurboTax and, the, you know, H&R Block online, um, you have these un, uh, online companies where you can go and and they have their software that you can use to prepare your taxes. You pay them and you prepare your taxes and then they file electronically. Um, the IRS is setting up its own system with its own software that uh, will allow people to go in and do their taxes right there just with the IRS, just like they would with um, uh, TurboTax or Block or, or any of the others. And, um, and then just file directly with the IRS through that. Um, and it's a system that's provided by the IRS um, and it's going to be, and, and it will be free for everyone who um, qualifies for it. The idea that this is, the, even though it's very limited, this is the first year that they're, that it's being tried out. And the um, plan, the hope is if it works out well, it will in a couple of years be available to everyone. So 
some things to keep in mind if you um, if you are unable to pay, um, if you owe back taxes or if you can't pay the taxes that are due. Um, a lot of times people think, oh, I can't pay. I better not file. I'll wait until I can pay or I wait until I've paid off this old debt. Um, that's that that is not a good idea. You should always file your tax returns on time, regardless of whether or not you can pay. Um, there is a couple of reasons for this. One is that the um, uh, the um, there's a penalty for paying late, but there's also a penalty for filing and paying late. And if you don't file and pay, then that penalty is ten times the penalty if you just um, if you just don't pay. So you get a much smaller penalty if you file um, but don't pay. Uh, also, um, when you uh, when when you owe taxes to the IRS, the IRS has a limited time, 10 years to collect that. That's a st collection statute of limitations. Um, but it um, uh, that doesn't start until the tax is assessed, which is either the due date of the return if you file by the by the due date, or if you don't file then it doesn't start until you file your return. So um, if you don't file your return, the clock doesn't start on the IRS. So by, by filing um, timely, even if you can't pay, you're reducing the amount of, of, of penalties and you're starting the clock on the IRS to, to collect um, your, your, your debt. Um, and if you owe taxes, there are um, options you can do instead of just full pay, you can um, set up an installment agreement. There's several different types of installment agreements. You can do something that's called an offer and compromise where you, um, uh, ask the IRS to uh, um, agree to only take basically what you're able to pay. Um, and then there's uh, something called currently not collectible status where uh, you are you still owe the debt, um, but the um, IRS is, and, um, is not collecting. Your penalties and interest continue to accrue, but the clock still is still continues to tick for the IRS even though they can't collect when you're in that status. Um, yeah, let me see, if, was there something else here? No, that was, um, yeah, I, I can start to take questions now. Um, the, the one thing I would, uh, other thing that I'll say about the, the collection alternatives is that again, that's something you can call us. Um, if you don't meet our, our, um, our financial criteria for representation, I can still give you a consultation with legal advice, I can, you know, I can give you legal advice, and it will uh, client confidentiality rules will apply. Um, but I just wouldn't be able to represent you. But if you do meet our our financial um, qualifications and we think you have a good case, we can represent you for free. Thank you so much, Tim. That was such great information. And I got a few questions here. Um, the first one is. Uh, my my spouse uh, passed away in November of last year. I'm mm -hmm. very sorry to hear that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, she says, "Can I file? Can I file jointly?" Um, yes, you can. You can file jointly the last year um, in 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 the in, um, in the year of death. You just need to um, uh, you can indicate that on the return um, that that it's a, a final final return. Um, and so for, for last year, you, you, you should be able to, yes. Perfect. Um, I have a question about the 1099C. Um, I have an individual who uses, he pays his rental income through Zelle to the landlord um, for a certain amount of money. Is that going to affect him one way or the other? Um, okay. Uh, first, I, I, if you were meaning the 1099K, the 1099C. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, um, a, it's the K probably. I... Okay, yeah, because the 1099C is about the cancellation of debt income. But in terms of the 1099K, um, apparently not with Zelle. Zelle is um, an odd exception because apparently they don't. So this is the, the definition of the people of the companies that have to use it is that they take the money from you and then they pay the other um, the other people. Zell apparently never actually holds on to the money themselves. They apparently um, mm -hmm. are set up so that they facilitate just a straight electronic payment from 
for the payor to the payee without Zelle ever holding it. So they don't, they're, they're, they're not going to be sending out 1099 Ks. Okay. Um, I have a gentleman, he said he's, he's 60 years old. He's claiming it. He says, there, are there any tax planning or new opportunities for um, people around that age? Um, well, I mean, certainly, uh, you can, you can take advantage of, um, if, if you, if you don't think that you, if you're, you know, doing well right now in your, um, income on your, um, uh, from your job, you know, you, you may be sort of at the peak of, of your, of your income. Um, and, and if, if that's the case, it might be a good time for you to use the catch up procedures for um, like a, a, a 401k or um, uh, or the IRAs where if you're over, um, I think it's over 50, you can, you can um, uh, contribute more to those than, um, than you, you could if you were, uh, when, when you were younger. Um, that's the main thing that I would say is a, um, is one that, that's specifically relevant to your, um, uh, to your age bracket there. Okay, so um, you mentioned the deadline to claim 2020 stimulus payments. Is there also a deadline for 2021? Yes, because um, the reason that that deadline exists is because you have three years from the date the, um, the return was due to claim a refund. Um, and so if you're getting the stimulus payment, you're getting it as a refund. Um, and so the, the, the due date of the 2020 um, returns was in uh, 2021. Three years from that is coming up in a, uh, you know, next month. Um, so for 2021, if you did not receive the, your, your 2021 stimulus payment, it would be um, mid-April of uh, 2025. So you'll have an extra year. I still say do it as soon as possible. Okay, when is it worth to, the trouble to itemize versus taking the standard deduction, both on federal and California state taxes? Um, well, if the if the itemized deduction ends up being more than the than the standard deduction, the standard deduction, um, uh, you you would generally what you do when you when you're preparing taxes, you go through if you have like a um, uh, software or the preparer, usually they'll go through and they'll ask you all of these mm -hmm. questions and uh, that relate to the deductions and then you answer them and then they'll figure out, okay, here's the itemized and here's based upon your, your answers and the, then the information you gave us, this is um, how much your itemized deductions would be. And then they compare it to the standard deduction. And if the itemized is more, mm -hmm. they take that. If not, you just go with the standard. Um, the only reason you might take the standard instead of the itemized is if you happen to be um, uh, organizationally impaired. Um, some, some of us don't um, it keep everything we're supposed to and know we were supposed to. Um, but, um, uh, but other than that, it's just whichever one is higher. Thank you. Uh, so what are the rulings if you're employed, but you have a side hustle that you run from your home. Okay, well, in, in, in that case, you have, it's, um, it's just, you, you, you have both. So you have, a, you're gonna get a W-2 and you're gonna treat that um, on the uh, tax return in, um, as, um, as wage income um, in, number, in part, part one there, just like um, you, you normally would. Plus you're also going to be filing a um, Schedule C and probably a Schedule SE for, for having your being self-employed and having your own business. Um, you you if you have your um, uh, an, an interesting question might be if you have a workstation. Um, I, I hadn't thought of this before, but um, if, if you work from home with your as an employee and you have a business where you work. You might want to have two different workstations and just pick up your um, <laughs> your uh, your laptop and move it to the other workstation because your for your business it's supposed to be it's an area that's supposed to be exclusively used for your business. So um, uh, you, you might want to have that kind of setup uh, just for tax purposes. But um, other than that, it's just you're just doing both. 
Perfect. I love that move in the desk. <laughs> yeah. uh, when does it make sense to use the long 1040 versus a shorter 1040 EZ? Um, uh, well, the, the EZ doesn't exist anymore. Um, I, well, don't, I don't remember when, but they phased that out several years ago. Um, the, the, they have a short form. Um, the, it, it depends on um, your, uh, your, your tax attributes and how complicated your tax return is. Certainly, if you have a business, you're going to be using the 1040 and not the short form. Um, if you have a, a more complicated deductions, I think the short form may be able to handle basic things like your, um, like your mortgage interest. But um, if it gets okay. a little bit more complicated than that, or if you like you have um, uh, interest, dividend income, you're not going to be able to use the short form. Um, I wouldn't. I I don't know those rules that well because even um, when I was, uh, um, you know, preparing taxes and stuff for the past few years, if you do anything electronically, it's just the the, the and which is what which is how I've used all of them. Um, the the program will just use whichever form. And in fact, if you file electronically, it's kind of its own sort of electronic form. It doesn't, you know, you don't actually have a 1040. It's just a bunch of uh, electronic um, signals set up in the format that the IRS requires. Yeah, and someone asked earlier, how do you keep up with all the adjustments? And typically they're all in the software, right? Shouldn't have to worry about all the new rules. Yeah, yeah, and all of yeah, all of, yeah, the new rules they'll, they'll they'll generally change that in the in the software. They'll definitely update you know the the um the inflation adjustments. Those those things are very easy for them to update. Just input new numbers, whatever the IRS tell issues. Um, so all of that is is updated in the software. Um, do you recommend any good tax software? Um, for accuracy, is they are they all the same? Um, I would not call them all the same. Um, mm -hmm. However, uh, I cannot recommend anything in yeah. any particular software um, because of my situation and the way we're funded. I, I I can't do that. The one thing I can recommend is if you qualify, go to Vibe. So um, they 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 have software that they use and it and it and it's free. So um, and they do. I mean, I wouldn't say that they're perfect, but my my um, my experience is they're 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 just as good as as the paid preparers. So um, uh, so that's my one recommendation. If you qualify, go to Vida. Okay, um, I have a retirement question here. If I retired in twenty twenty three, is there anything I should be particularly aware of of filing my taxes this year? Hmm. Um, main thing I would think of is, um, uh, checking your retirement distributions. I know some people get into, tr into trouble because they forget to put their retirement distributions on, on, on the tax return. Um, they, um, even, even if you're retired, you might want to check and make sure, I mean, you, if you're retired, you're probably at the right age to, to get the distributions and not pay the 10%, um, penalty tax. Um, but you just want to make sure that that's the case. Um, you also want to make sure. So the other thing is a lot of people, it depends on whether what, what type of retirement plan you have, whether it was taxed when, whether or not it was yeah. tax deductible at the time that you, that, that you paid in. If it was tax deductible at the time that you paid in, you need to remember that you're going to pay taxes on it when you get it, take it out. Even if you're not subject to the 10% penalty, you still have to pay taxes on the income itself. A lot of people forget that. Um, again, but that's if it, you got the deduction. Now, sometimes if you had like an, a Roth IRA where you did not get a deduction, then usually you can um, take that out tax-free. But that, so that's something you're going to need to look at. What kind of IRA do I have or, or what kind of 401k retirement plan? Is it taxable? And make sure you, um, you put it on the return if it is. The 529 plan conversion to Roth applies for new plans or the old existing plans? Um, old, old existing plans, any, any, yes. any um, all, 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 all plans. If, if, if it didn't get used for education, 
There's a number of other things that, can, they, that you can do with it. You, there's ways of converting it to a, 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 a 529 plan for a, another family member or putting into an ABLE account. Um, but um, it, but this the, the, the Roth is just one, um, Roth IRA is just one option. Um, and uh, again, it's and again any um, 529 plan if, if if it didn't end up getting used for education. Yeah, and I and um, the, I was just reading uh, the Kiplinger magazine for this month talks about um, the 529 conversions, and it has quite a few detailed information. So if you wanted to get more information on that, just pick up the the latest Kiplinger's Money magazine. And uh, I have one more question here. It's um, if you take out your funds from your 401, uh, I think we already, if you take out funds from your 401k at 62 and your tax when you take it out, but are you also put in a different tax bracket due to the amount and then tax again? So double taxed? Uh, I don't think so. Well, no, I mean, you might end up into a different tax bracket, but as as I um, explained, that, that that's not a, that there, there's no double tax there because you don't get, it's not like you get taxed when you take it out and then you get taxed putting it on your return. It's putting it on your return is how you're getting taxed. Um, uh, when you take it out, it may be a good idea if you're taking out a good bit of it to um, to send in um, an estimated tax payment to the IRS um, so that you know you don't get caught having spent the money and, 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 and can't pay it. Or if you like take it out at the beginning of the year um, the IRS may not like the fact that you took it out and and they didn't get the, the you know okay. th there's the interest during the year and so that you can be penalized for under withholding um, so you you might need to send in a, um, uh, a a payment but if you do send in a payment you get credit for that payment when you file your um, your return so you're, there there is no double taxation uh, you might go into a higher tax bracket but as I explained. The, um, that only applies to the extra money in that tax bracket. It's not going to, it's not going to raise the taxes or make you pay more taxes on any of your other income. Last question: Are there any tax ramifications or limits with respecting to inheriting a uh, uh, an IRA, a fifty thousand dollar IRA? Um. In there are there are some things you need to consider. I I, I haven't uh, um, I don't know those rules as as well as I know some of this other stuff. But the 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 main thing here is so the you the your as far as a like a state tax that's paid by the the estate itself, not you. You're not paying taxes on on um, on on income received that's been inherited. Um, what you might end up having to do with the IRA, though, if particularly if it's an IRA that um, uh, that that like a regular IRA where the um, decedent got a um, tax deduction when they made a contribution, uh, the IRS is still going to want to want its um, want it want it taxed when it comes out, whoever it ends up going to. Um, and what what so one you need to just realize when you pull it out if it was a um, again if it was like a regular IRA um, then then you know you're going to need to put it on your income um, uh, because it hasn't been taxed yet the other thing is that you're going to need to look at the rules for when you can take it out without paying the 10 percent penalty that's the main thing I don't know right now I, I can't tell you off the top of my head um, if you call me and uh, I can I can look it up and do a consultation so I could um, I, I could give you the, that, that, that information, or you could just try to look it up, but just know that that's an issue. Um, there, there are special rules for that situation for being able to, to take it out without paying the 10% um, excise tax. All right. And Timothy, before we hop off here, um, <clears throat> there were quite a few questions that came through that unfortunately, we did not have the time to get to all of them. Um, I've been sharing with everybody your email, and we have your phone number right there. Um, so just a reminder to anybody, if your question did not get answered, we do encourage you to reach out to Timothy, he can, you know, answer those one off questions. Um, one last question, do you happen to have any other resources that you might um, guide people to if they just have little one off questions, and maybe you don't want to make a whole, you know, appointment or phone call out of it? Um, are there 
there any other resources that are tax related that you might want to guide um, our attendees to? Um, well, the IRS itself has a lot of um, uh, on on their website. They have facts, you know, the frequently asked questions, and and they have publications. Um, so you can you can always go there and um, and and get information. Um, uh, beyond that, um, uh, I don't know. Best recommendation is 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 calling me just for you know like free tax tax type advice me or some other um low income taxpayer clinic there's two others in the bay area and um uh and there's a whole bunch of others around the country um tim can you just go back to your phone number again and leave that on oh, the screen okay in your, in your email okay yeah and you did an amazing job tonight and we're so appreciative because you are our best and favorite Good Samaritan of the day. Because he volunteers, you guys, he volunteers to come and support our amazing members. So we would like to give you a heartfelt thank you. And, and that uh, we are so amazed that and, you and I and I would like to thank you so much for letting me letting me come here. It's all it's always a great experience. And I'm I'm and I'm I'm very glad for it. So uh, you guys have an amazing evening. Thank you for showing up for your financial health. Um, come back, we're doing the estate planning. And we also have some really dy dynamic and fun presentations that Andrew and I have prepared especially for you. So know that we honor you, we support you, um, and we are your financial cheerleaders. Yay, you. We'll talk to you later. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Say good night, Andrew. Say good night, Peggy. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Bye, Timothy.